Hello and welcome to Capital Market Live from Channels Television, where you get an in-depth analysis of how your stocks performed for the week and other market events. I'm Will Ebong. Let's get a quick summary of market close for major indexes on the global scene. Now for European markets, they closed high on Friday after finishing their best month since January and made a global rally in stocks and bonds. Major bosses ended on an upbeat note after flash data estimated Eurozone inflation has now fallen to 2.4%, down from 2.9% in October, and significantly lower than forecast. Meanwhile, all prices were lower Friday after OPEC Plus announced that there would be no formal extension of production cuts. However, Saudi Arabia extended its 1 million barrel per day voluntary cut into the first quarter, and other members have announced their own reductions. Now let's look at Asia now. Asia-Pacific markets started Friday lower, breaking ranks with Wall Street, which mostly advanced on Thursday amid mixed economic data from across the region. Investors assess China's side chain manufacturing purchasing managers index for November, which showed that the sector unexpectedly rose. The side chain PMI reading came in at 50.7 compared to 49.5 points in October, beating economists' forecast. Now, this comes after official numbers on Thursday showed the country's manufacturing sector contracted for a second straight month. Now, in the U.S., the S&P 500 soared to a closing high for 2023 on Friday, extending November's rally into the new month. The broad market index rose by 0.59%, ending the session at 4,594 points. Now, the tech-heavy Nasdaq composite advanced to 0.55% to 14,305 points. The Dow Jones Industrial Average added 0.82%. The Dow rose to another new high on Friday, bringing its 2023 gain to nearly 9.4%. Now, this week, the S&P 500 added 0.77%, while the Dow rallied 2.4%. The Nasdaq advanced 0.38%. It marked the fifth consecutive week of gains for the major averages. Back home and this week, the local equities market saw an uptick driven by bargain hunting in Saplet, which is up about 10%, and Nestle, which is up about 9.5%. Now, the all share index advanced by 0.27% week on week to close at 39.4% year to date. Now, trading activity was positive as well. The total volume traded and value increased by 4.9% and 70.5% week on week. Elsewhere, sectoral performance was mixed. We saw gains in the banking and oil and gas indexes and losses in the insurance, industrial goods and consumer goods indexes. Now, Mercure Industries topped the gainers chart for the week. That's the second week in a row now. And we see Thomas Wyatt made that flip to the top gainers chart after trading in the bottom three last week. Unfortunately, some stocks have to occupy that space and Omatec Ventures led that pack of losers. The trio of Universal Insurance, Access Holdings, and Transnational Corporation top trades by volume. Similarly, the NASD on listed securities market closed positive. The good green stuff appears to be rubbing off on them too. Now, the index rose 0.41% to close at 860 points. Turnover for the week was, however, weak. Volume fell about 69% to 4.22 million units traded, while value dropped by about a similar margin to 41 million naira from 142 million naira it traded with last week. Now, Double One PLC clinched the top spot on the gainer's leaderboard, while UBN Property recorded the most losses. And no surprise, the stock was the most traded in terms of volume. Now, we have with us in the studio, Professor Uche Uwalike is a professor of capital markets and director of the Institute of Capital Market Studies, Nassau State University. Good Evening, Prof. It's good to have you in the studio with us here in Lagos. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, well, my, Prof, my pleasure. Prof, we've seen the market for November. It was neither here or there. It was trading quite flat, but still maintaining that upbeat mode in terms of the momentum. It's not, we can't say it was really, it was a bullish month. Let's oh, just say yes, it was a bullish month. Uh, 3.15% is <laughs> Yes, 3.9% uh, is really a good one. Yes. But the market is a bit cautious. What would you say, how would you say November panned out or played out for investors and traders? Well, I would say positive uh, on the average. As I mentioned earlier, if you look at month to, uh, well, the month of November, 3.15%. Uh, um, and um, if you compare that with what we have also seen 
elsewhere. If you use the Morgan Stanley Capital Index um, as proxy um, for emerging markets that tracks performance of um, 24 uh, stock markets in emerging economies, you will find that for the emerging markets, on the average, it actually fell by, by minus 3.88% for the month of November. And if you also look at that of the world, you know, Morgan Stanley Capital Index for the world, for developed economies, we actually also recorded negative performance for the month of November. But if you look at it in terms of year to date, okay, um, our market is uh, posting 39.4%, as you, as you mentioned. Elsewhere, for emerging markets generally, the number is still in the negative territory, minus 1.8. Okay, it's only in developed markets um, that you find um, a positive um, uh, you know, performance of about 8%. -8%. And that's on the back of what you mentioned that, you know, during your background report, you know, uh, drop in inflation rates in the Euros, in the Euro area, in the UK, in the, in the US, inflation rates you know, appears to be going down. So that's also reflecting in the performance um, in those markets. But overall, um, what has become very clear is that our market, when I say our market, I mean our equities market, you know, you know has outperformed you know, these other markets. So for the month of November, it's been positive, particularly for in the banking stocks, uh, okay? Um, particularly for insurance, particularly for um, even the oil and gas. The oil and gas for the month of November I posted, I think, 11% return. Okay, year to date, we are talking about 126% the oil and gas. And of course, that's where you find the likes of Seplat. Okay, look at Seplat today. Um, you know, virtually the most expensive um, in a stock at 2,310 naira. That was as a, the last um, as a Friday, as of Friday, you know, Seplat. So the likes of Seplat, oil and gas, if you, if you also look at the banking, okay, you've also seen uh, the likes of GT, for example, uh, today at 39 naira, the likes of um, Zenit at 34, 34 naira, you know, First Bank at 22 naira. These banks, you know, um, have also succeeded in a you know, pulling, pulling, the, pulling the market. In the ICT sector too, we've also seen uh, some impressive performance, especially coming from Airtel. Today, the last time I checked, Airtel has gone, gone up to as, you know, as much as 1,800 naira, you know, for a single stock. Now, if you, if you look at that, okay, that also appears to reflect even the performance of the economy. Um, if you look at the last GDP report by the National Bureau of Statistics, the quarter 3, 2023 report, what does it say? It says that the economy grew by 2.54%. If you check the drivers, the sectors that powered the tax growth, it is the financial services sector, where we recorded 28%, as high as 28% growth rate. You also find um, the ICT. ICT recorded, I think, 6.8% growth rate. So that is also uh, you know, reflected in the, in the performance of you know, these economic sectors. Mm. All right. Where we have not recorded, um, I would say, impressive performance is in industrial stocks. Industrial goods sector, you know, is still below the market, market average. Market average today is 39.5 points, um, you know, for as you mentioned. That is the year to day return. Yeah, return. But that of the industrial goods, okay, where they have the likes of, you know, Berger Paints, um, um, Boa Cement, uh, industrial goods sector is below average at just 15%. So, Again, that tells you, uh, I was you know, talking at an event today, capital market event earlier today, and I was saying that it tells you about, it speaks to the disconnect you know, that we'll still have between the financial sector and the real sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. The financial sector is growing, GDP says 28%, for example, but the real sectors are not you know, growing as much. The real sector, talking about uh, the manufacturing okay. sector, the agri sector, agri sector, grew by just 1.3% in, uh, in Q3. Do you think these companies, or the companies listed under the industrial or the real uh, sectors, have not affected, or do you think the FX problem is what is really biting hard on them? Economic right headwinds, um, you know, generally. Um, FX is, of course, one of them. Um, and then the rising cost of, um, you know, um, inflation, okay? Inflation is, is a factor. Rising cost of production is also hitting the industrial um, you know, sector. In the case of banks, the banks would appear to have benefited from the FX you know, situation. Um, a, lot, a lot of banks reported forex gains. You know, as, 
as we know, you know, know it today, apart from Unity Bank, most of the banks recorded them forest gains. So the banking sector appears to be, be benefiting from the, you know, um, the situation we find ourselves in the, in the forex market in terms of uh, the exchange rate, um, um, you know, the variance yes, the volatility. Yeah. Okay, that's why I talked about this disconnect between the um, banking sector and the the, the real sectors. Okay. But these other sectors, um, no doubt, have, you know, have been hard hit by economic headwinds. Now let's still talk about the banking sector and just look at the central bank's new policy stance in terms of how they want to monitor inflation. It's now it's going to be inflation targeted, but we're also looking at bank recapitalization. Still talking about banks, do you think that with the way it's going, when the recapitalization sets in, that it's still going to be profitable for banks at that moment? Absolutely. Well, if um, the 2005 experience is any guide, um, I think the recapitalization you know, um, there are routes to recapitalization. The, well, there is the major um, M&A, and there is also the, uh, the route of um, offer for subscription, you know, issuing shares. Whether you're doing offer for subscription or you're doing rights issue, okay? All of that would involve issuing new shares, and that will also mean, you know, uh, increasing the overall market capitalization, okay? So, um, by and large, it is going to have a positive impact you know, on the market. The that market. is the market, the proposed um, the capitalization of the banks. Okay. And you know, there's no doubt about that. Okay. Um, again, the issue of inflation, uh, inflation targeting is when a, situa a situation in which the central bank, you know, um, sets a rate that is, you know, sees as a goal, and then uses monetary policy to try to, you know, attain that, you know, that rate. For now, central bank's target band is between 6 and 9%, but of course we know Current inflation rate is very far from, from it. Twenty seven point three. So I, I wonder, and I'm quite sure a lot, of, a, a, a lot of other people are wondering, yes. but what rates, what inflation rates will the central bank be comfortable with in terms of inflation targeting to say, yes, we've gotten to that rate, speak to the point where we can now say, this is the level we, we, we've targeted inflation, we're able to control it at this point. Where, where do you think well, the CBS Well, the, from what we know, research, you know, um, available evidence shows that um, Inflation rate of 12% actually uh, is what will um, would not be too bad. Okay, that level of inflation can still support economic growth. But, is that but of course, we know that even in the 2024 budget pro projection, okay, what the government is providing for is 21.4% inflation mm -hmm. rate, which is still you know on the high side. But uh, considering that inflation rate today is 27.3, okay. Um, having a 21.4 inflation rate target for 20, uh, um, you know, 24, for example, you know, would seem like um, maybe a, a, an improvement. Of course, don't forget the relationship between inflation rate and the, the market. The higher the, you have inflation, okay, it also wraps up negatively on, um, you know, um, animal spirits, you know, so to say, <laughs> investment in the, in the market. Because in, a typical investor is concerned about the return. The typical investor wants to have positive rate of return. The good news, however, is that the rate of return in our market today is positive because it's higher than inflation. If the market is returning on the average 39.4, inflation rate is at 27.3, mm. it means that return is positive. And it's, 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 the market is about the only place where you can find real positive interest rates, you know, returns. In Nigeria today, many asset, asset classes the, what they offer is negative free rate of return because of the high you know, inflation, inflation rate. Yes, inflation targeting is, um, is good, but again, what is, um, what is clear and what must not be lost on the central bank is that the effort to, to deal with inflation is not to be um, um, you know, restricted to that of the central bank because a number of factors that are driving inflation in Nigeria today are mm -hmm. exogenous to the central bank. Central bank does not have control over insecurity. Mm -hmm. Central bank does not have control over the uh, cost of energy, the, the power, uh, you know, transport, you know, and so on. These are issues in the realm of the fiscal you know, authority. So the fiscal authority and monetary authority must collaborate to be able to deal with inflation, given that inflation drivers in Nigeria today are not completely monetary. No, it's definitely. only when they're monetary, you can use monetary policy tools to tackle them. You've just hit the nail on the head. The fiscal and the monetary authorities have to work together to be able to combat inflation and ensure that the economy moves Absolute, forward. Absolutely. So we'll take a quick break now. Right after that, capital markets continue. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Now, on Wednesday, President Bola Ahmed Tunubu presented the 2024 full year executive budget proposal titled Budget of Renewed Hope to the National Assembly. Now, a breakdown of the proposal reveals that the federal government intends to spend 27.5 trillion naira. Now, at the same time, the federal government is projecting a total revenue of 18.32 trillion naira in the 2024 fiscal year. Now, Professor Uche Waleke. Professor of Capital Markets and Director, Institute of Capital Market Studies, Nasara State University, is still with us in the studio. Professor, we've seen this GDP, I mean, we've seen the, the growth in the GDP, we talked about that, and we've seen the budget for 2024. Looking at the, the growth areas, the areas that contributed the most to the GDP, do you think that our president, President Bolatinubu, allocated enough to critical sectors to be able to drive growth in the economy? Okay, I think it's about um, the priority areas of the government, the eight-point agenda, uh, which is why you find defense, for example, taking the largest chunk, 3.2 trillion, um, that's about 12% of, of the budget size, uh, followed by education, about 2.3 trillion, um, that's 7.9% of the budget size. You now have also health, 1.3, 5% of the budget size. Now, infrastructure also got, um, I think, about 1.3 another 5% you know, of the budget. So those represent the priorities um, you know, of, of the government. Of course, one would have wished them, these um, sectors, education, health, infrastructure, one would have wished they got more. But of course, it's a function of what, they, what you allocate is a function of um, you know, revenue. Okay? Um, um, otherwise, um, the other option, of course, is for you to have very huge um, you know, budget deficit. And when you have a budget deficit, it has to be financed. And how do we finance budget deficits, in, you know, uh, particularly here, is usually through, you know, largely through, through borrowing. Now, let me say that that, pre that um, 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 presentation of, of the proposed budget, you know, excited the, the market, you know, for understandable, understandable reasons. If you notice, the market actually, you know, went up the very day the thing was made. And that's because, you know, we often say government spending represents 10% of um, the, you know, aggregate demand. Even though it's just 10% of aggregate demand, it usually has an accelerator effect, you know, on the financial plans of, including the subnationals, because subnationals are also waiting for the federal government to present the budget before they can take their own, um, uh, you know, um, benchmarks and assumptions, particularly with respect to uh, oil price, okay, and then, um, you know, revenue. Remember, the subnationals, most of them depend on what comes from the center. Okay, under FAC allocation, states get 26.7%. The federal government gets uh, 52, the states get 26.7. And local governments are also getting 20.6 or thereabout. So they all depend on, unfortunately, though, on what comes uh, from FAC. So it's important that that's, um, uh, you know, the uh, budget proposals are. And it's also important that the National Assembly, uh, you know, should. Um, you know, uh, interrogate them as quickly as possible so that okay. from 1st January, implementation can kick off. But what I, I, I need to make, make this point, you don't need any fortune teller to tell you that the interest rate environment in 2024 is going to be high because of the borrowing element. The budget has a deficit of 9.8 um, trillion mm. to be financed largely by borrowing. New borrowing is 7.8 trillion. Now, out of that new borrowing of 7.8 trillion, domestic borrowing, unlike in previous years, domestic borrowing is um, around 6.1, accounts for about 78% uh, of the total. Oh. Okay? What that means is that government will borrow aggressively from the domestic market. What is going to be the effect? It is going to drive up interest really? rates. Rates are going to go up. So if government is borrowing and rates are going up on the one hand, and it's on the other hand, the central bank is standing monetary policy using OMO, using um, MPR and so on, interest rates will go up. And if interest rates go up, what will happen to equities market? It's going to dwindle. Oh, yes, because um, investors, portfolio managers will rebalance their portfolio in mm -hmm. favor of fixed income. So it is going to really depress the equities uh, you know, market. That's what, that's what I see. That's what, that's what, that is what is going to be the likely effect of the budget on the okay. stock market. Okay. So the stock market um, next year, 
uh, majorly will be maybe it's going to be down partly on account of the rising interest rate um, environment we are likely to see because of the increase in um, borrowing the only thing that will moderate it is if the right instrument is used to make the borrowing by that i mean if the government uses more of infrastructure bonds to do to borrow this 6.1 trillion Okay, as opposed to just using FGM, FGM bonds. bonds. Okay, and yes. Treasury bills and, and getting uh, exactly interest, because interest rates FGM higher. bonds have discretionary feature. When you do FGM bonds, you can use them for anything. But when you use infrastructure bonds, the funds are entrenched, yes, and they're tied to projects. Okay. So my advice is that government should focus more on, you know, uh, using infrastructure bonds. So Cook is, is one of them. Green bonds, um, infrastructure bonds, where you are sure that the funds are, you know. Um, tied to particular projects. I'm not yeah. sure. So, but some of the, I heard someone say, it's uh, just, you know, one of the forums that I've been to, someone said that the recovery of the stolen, you know, the, the stolen uh, monies that have been recovered may be used to finance the deficit. Do you think that the government has any plans in that regard? It's not provided. The deficit we, the, is clear, okay, even from the MTEF, the thing is clear. There are three components of the financing. The first is um, borrowing, new borrowing. Okay, the second is drawdown on multilateral and bilateral loans, which is also loan. These ones have already been maybe negotiated. Okay, and then the third component is very infinitesimal. That's talking about privatization proceeds. For 2024, it's just about 200, uh, uh, less than 250 billion. Okay, so the major means of financing the um, budget is um, likely to borrowing. Of course, if we are getting recoveries, okay, that should be um, an addition. And those recoveries, in my view, if we also have them, we should tie them to specific things that we can, say, that we can, we can point to and say, this is what the recoveries, you know, we are used for. Okay, so let's look at this, uh, the ripple effect of, you know, increased borrowing, aggressive borrowing in the domestic market, which would drive interest rates of four banks and those, and driving borrowing costs through tightening, monetary policy tightening by the Central Bank of Nigeria. So if this interest rate keeps going up because we're trying to combat inflation, mm -hmm. do you think Nigeria is going to be seeing a huge number of MPLs as non-performing loans anytime soon, coming, let's say, in the near to medium term? Yes, that's, that's, um, that's also going to be, if you like, um, an, an unintended um, you know, outcome, consequence. As we speak, the uh, prudential ratios, I think even the CBN governor admitted that prudential ratios are very much um, you know, within uh, you know, limits. Non-performing loans, for example, the central bank limit is 5% for, for MPLs. And um, according to the central bank data, um, uh, for, uh, as far as MPLs are concerned, the art is under 5%. Okay, capital adequacy ratio two is uh, very much in, in order. Um, all right, and of course, liquidity ratio again for most banks is above um, the threshold of uh, you know 30 percent. So, to that extent, you would say the financial system is uh, resilient. So, with respect to non performing loans, of course, the more you um, increase, particularly the monetary policy rate, as soon as you increase monetary policy rate, because central bank now says they want to use that as a, a true anchor of interest rates, which is why. You now find them issuing um, the, the treasury bills at close to, uh, the last time it was 17%. Yes, okay, NPR today is 18.75. Um, okay, so they want the NPR to be the anchors, all right? So, as I said, that will also mean, um, you know, in my view, is also encouraging rent seeking because a lot of people, a lot of people will now be packing their funds, you know, so in, in the government market. securities. If yeah. you can sleep and get... Um, uh, 17%, 18%, 18%. Yes, what kind of uh, business would you be doing? You wouldn't want to do any productive activity. So that's also the disadvantage, you know, of having that kind of, um, um, you know, uh, in, um, environment. So when you have high interest rates, once you increase NPR, what usually happens from experience that the banks quickly reprise their loans. The banks will reprise their loans, will increase interest rates, all right? Mm -hmm. Because some loans are based on NPR plus. Mm -hmm. So the moment you move NPR, you also increase it, all right? Um, and so you should expect that um, it can also lead to, uh, you know, increasing default rates um, mm. um, and um, increasing MP MPLs. Okay, just so while you're at it, just give us a brief outlook of what you think December holds, the month of December holds for investors and traders. Well, um, there's this study, uh, you know, I was looking at that says that in the last 20 years, um, the month of December has recorded uh, positive returns 16 times. 
Mm. Okay, and negative returns four times in the last 20 years. So if we use that as a guide, 16 times positive return for December and four times um, you know, negative returns, it means that um, there is a likelihood of seven, there is a 70 percent probability that is going to turn out uh, positive. But the, the month of December, the way I see it, may, may also represent an outlier, if you, if you call it that, uh, mm -hmm. from this, thing I've, um, this scenario I've painted now. And, and that's because, again, we are looking at um, a situation in which people are expecting interest rates to go up. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at um, a situation in which a lot of people believe inflation rate has not bottomed out. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, And then you're also looking at uh, sell-offs likely sell-offs for people, you know, for, uh, this liquidity preference, people preferring to have cash for festive seasons. So if the market is going to rebound, maybe sometime uh, in, in January. So December, okay, may not be as positive, as strong as we had uh, in the month of November. So we shouldn't expect a Santa Claus rally. <laughs> yes, Santa Claus rally, of course, usually what happens uh, the last seven days of the last five days of the month and the first two days of okay. the next month. Yes, it may, we may not see Santa Claus rally. Ah, too bad, year. too bad, Professor. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but that's it. So thank you so much. Uh, many thanks, Professor Uche, Uche Waleke, Professor of Capital Market, Nasara State University, yeah. for coming on Capital Market and sharing your perspective and insights. Thank you, Will. My pleasure. And that's it on Capital Market. Do join us same time next week. Don't forget, you can watch this again on our channel's television page on YouTube. Also, follow us on our other social media platforms to get updates. I'm Will Ibang. It's bye-bye for now.